Bitcoin is so small compared to gold, factor of 20 in terms mm-hmm. of market cap, because you can't compare, compare Bitcoin uh, in terms of price. Okay, wow, this is so amazing when Bitcoin uh, was $900 and gold was at $900. We got parity, one ounce of gold. Yeah, who cares? They're, you're measuring horses and, and lettuce or yeah. completely unrelated things. But market cap, yes, the size of the market of Bitcoin is 20 times smaller than that of gold. It will have to be around $600,000 per Bitcoin to match that of gold. And that's what I expect is going to happen. And at time of crisis, it'll be like this. But then what will happen in people's mind that they have been traditionally investing in gold to look at that is like, wow, uh, now we've got the contender. Have you ever felt like the only Bitcoin enthusiast in your area? I certainly did. It is literally why I started the podcast was just to meet other Bitcoiners. As it turns out, there was an easier way. I could have simply joined Orange Pill app. Orange Pill app is the ultimate social layer in Bitcoin. It was built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. It is where you will find other Bitcoiners in your local area. It is where you will find events in your local area and where you can also connect with merchants who take Bitcoin. So please hop on a board, use the affiliate link below, and I'll look forward to seeing you there. Hello, and today we have um, a very special guest on board with us. We have Phil Champagne, who is author of Book of Satoshi and also author now of new book, Bitcoin versus altcoins. Uh, welcome aboard to Bitcoin People, Phil. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was, uh, it's great to see you again. I mean, it was great to see you in, in Miami. Absolutely. This is where we first met. And um, I you gave you gave me a copy of your book. I actually can't remember if or I bought a copy of your book. Oh, no, you gave me a copy of your book. Not signed. Phil, not signed. Deeply disappointed. Oh, (laughs) Okay, I'm taking the plane right now. (laughs) Next Miami, I'm bringing it with me and you can sign it there. Okay, Um, Phil, uh, Really interesting choice of second book. You started, your first book was basically a historical book. It was, you realized that Satoshi was one day going to be a historical figure. Mm -hmm. He was changing the course of, he, she, they Mm -hmm. were changing the course of history and you wanted it documented. And It feels to me like the new book, and I want to get more into your background and all sorts of things in a moment, but it feels to me like the new book has got a little bit of the same energy to it in terms of wanting to historically kind of record Mm -hmm. the process of the rise of altcoins, Mm -hmm. how they came to be, why they came to be, their role and position in the, you know, in the, in the scheme of things. Is that fair to say? Uh, I think it is. I mean, I, um, I'm passionate of uh, history. And um, to me, um, one of the things I, I mentioned about um, the, the book of Satoshi is like it's a future history book. Well, when I wrote this was in 2014 and it was so fresh. I mean, it's just like equivalent of right after World War II, Books about the events of World War II in 47, 48 were news more than history, you know, but you move 20 years later in the 60s and now, okay, we're talking about history now and it's even more. So I understood that in the 2020s, uh, this will become history. And uh, so that's, that was uh, the, uh, uh, just amazing. And the reason uh, I uh, was passionate about all, all that is also in terms of uh, financial and that's really what is, uh, it's in a financial history as well. And really that's bringing so much uh, forces into economic values and uh, in terms of war and so on. Because when you look at it, all the wars have been financed, um, had to be financed in some way. So yeah. that is influencing heavily history. History, And another of my favorite book, it's uh, not, it's from G. Edward Griffin. It's the, the Creature from Jekyll Island. And I highly recommend people read this because now that goes back from the 14th century all the way to uh, 
uh, early 20th century with uh, the creation of Federal Reserve Act in the U.S., but um, it gives so much perspective in that into the past as well. And but to me, it was uh, this was just about to be history again. Uh, but uh, this guy, what he's done is just like the Gutenberg press equivalent in terms of uh, but on the decentralized currency, you know, uh, and sound money. So it's just a major impact. It was just a matter of. <clears throat> no, seeing this rolling in uh, in history, but it's uh, it's a matter of time to. This will be uh, the the text will get even more value as we go further in time because there'll be even more history. You know. So, to come back to your question about Bitcoin versus altcoin, uh, indeed, uh, I see that uh, what I saw mostly uh, changing drastically was in 2017. Because when you when you look at the uh, the chart of the Bitcoin dominance, uh, mm. it was pretty much um, oh yeah that's right it's right here yeah see so it was yeah. pretty much uh, a handful in beginning the beginning it was oh you're looking at the early ninety five ninety eight ninety nine percent Bitcoin well uh, yeah 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 the yep, beginning yep. was one hundred percent until something happened you know like Litecoin and all those things. But in 2017 is really where they got a big drop with Ethereum and XRP, uh, those two among others, uh, moving up so much, uh, taking so much uh, importance uh, in terms of market cap that the market compared to the market cap of Bitcoin influenced things. And that the term shitcoin started to be really more dominant into um, the conversations on Twitter and so on, because now suddenly... Um, there was way more importance allocated by newcomers towards altcoins than it was in the beginning because Bitcoin, mostly beginning people were going into Bitcoin. There was nothing else they heard about. You know, they didn't know what is Ethereum or what is Litecoin. You know, it's Bitcoin they hold, they heard about. So that was a big shift in terms of uh, historically what happened was 2017, a big shift. You know, so. To put that in perspective and what is going on from there is why I, I wrote the book, you know, to give an idea of for people what's going on and where we're going and why people should still focus on Bitcoin. Excellent. Okay. Because I had a moment of saying to you online going, I have never actually properly defined whether I'm a Bitcoin only podcast or not. It's called Bitcoin people, but does that mean it's Bitcoin only people? <laughs> And what I like is that you present a case that shows what altcoins are all about. It actually brings in some positives about altcoins, but brings it back to Bitcoin at the end of the day. So let me just get, uh, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind doing a little bit of a backup and understanding a bit about you. You're, um, you're a software engineer. You've got half a dozen or more, maybe a dozen patents out there or patents, I think mm. you pronounce them. You yeah. uh, so you're an inventor. You've got this creative mind. You're interested in history. Uh, you grew up, I understand, in Quebec, but you're now on the west coast of the U.S. Uh, let me just get a picture of who you are, Phil, and your back. Like, what made you you? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, so. My father was in business, a businessman, and um, in the 80s, you know, in conversation with him, you know, I, I was pretty much raised with a more, not a left-leaning perspective, but more like a pro-business. You know, one of the arguments he told me is like, uh, well, if I had to go and go and kill a lion to feed my family. Well, I don't think anybody would eat a lion, but I mean, the um, principle was defending probably. Um, but uh, but the other guy that is too afraid to go out and kill a lion. Uh, why do I have to kill two lions for the other guy next door? You know, it was just like a mindset of what things were in 30 years, 30,000 years ago uh, as an example of what it is and why socialism is not good. And to me, my perspective today is like, well, we are not ants. And because we're not ants, socialism is not workable for humans. But uh, so, I mean, I 
derive that basically from that early early uh, learning of those things. But obviously, through uh, the propaganda of university, even though it was an, an electrical engineer, my background, you get out of this and somehow you start to be more left leaning. And but in the early 2000, I my CPA told me um, suggested I read um, Rich Dad Poor Dad, uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Yep. And so I did. And the light bulb turned on because my father was, uh, unfortunately, he was extremely good in terms of business, but no skills in terms of investment. So there was no investment, it was just all about his business. And, um, but uh, in my case, like it's a little bit more difficult in terms of, okay, uh, the, the, the mindset of, um, in terms of business, when you're talking about that, there's, a, there's multiple aspects to it. And one of those is a promotion and being a good promoter and so on. And so it's a little bit more of a weakness for me, but of course the uh, investment is um, felt really appropriate for me. So I was felt really in love with this. And I just wish my father didn't pass away in 1993 um, mm -hmm. because um, uh, 1992, because uh, I there would be so much uh, conversation with him and I would have been able to, you know, invest. And uh, at the time while he was <laughs> merge our business kind of, you know, together in some way. Yeah. yeah. But um, so I, that's where I started learning about real estate and investment in real estate and the concept of um, overall general, generally speaking, investment and cash flow is king and not cash, but cash flow is the kind of um, psychological point there. And the, then from 2007, 2008, started learning about uh, gold and because um, Kiyosaki at some point mentioned gold and silver. So I was a little bit curious, but you know, so, it doesn't bring any cash flow, you know, it doesn't bring yeah. dividends. It's just, uh, what's the purpose? So no concept of the Austrian school business cycles and all that. So I, but I started reading those things and really was like, oh my God, that I love that to understand this. The, what we hear about the economy is so freaking complex. The way they present it to us, they always presented it to us. And but suddenly it was so simple with Austrian school. It's yeah, it's actually much easier to understand than listening to uh, Ben Bernanke, you know. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> um, I hadn't realized that the creature of Jekyll Island goes Island goes into all of that history. I thought it was more just about the events of yeah, the formation of the Fed, and it is one of the history books I want to read along with there's more Austrian economics yeah. I need to read. Plus, I want to read your book, you know, Book of Satoshi. Mm -hmm. Plus, I really need to read The Block Size Wars. So there's just a bunch of kind of yeah. just pure history I need to read. So uh, explain to me, you've got some really fabulous examples in your book, in, in your most recent book, about uh, about life on a gold standard mm -hmm. and the the capacity for gold to maintain its uh, purchasing power, its value. You also talk about um, that some people still did take risky, speculative, if you like, investments. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet I get intrigued by, I mean, it's not like life on a gold standard was perfect. Life wasn't ideal, but then they didn't also, also have the hygiene, the medicine and the yeah. Uh, technology that we yeah. have today. Yeah. So the idea of what was the best of the life that used to exist and then couple it with today's technology, and I'm going to say cleanliness, the sheer cleanliness of our cities, mm -hmm. but, yeah. you know, I'm sure there's a whole lot more beyond that. Um, and I try to use those two combined to imagine what life on a Bitcoin standard could be. Uh, and so I think my question is, tell me a bit about your historical understanding of life on a gold standard. And then let's kind of move towards the more recent history mm -hmm. into altcoins. And then I wouldn't mind yeah. looking into the future with you. Okay. And put your okay. science fiction hat on. Let's get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so okay. obviously, um, 
it's difficult to imagine how things would be if we never left a gold standard. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, if we never left and um, all we had to deal with are localized uh, bank runs because a, one given bank, there's no central banking and one mm. local banks might you know, do fractional reserve banking a little bit too much and therefore they're, you know, they're, they're going bust. Um, that is, if that was the extent of the manipulation, basically just localized uh, bank run uh, yeah. by uh, banks here and there, which was the case back then before central banking. I mean, I've, to me, no, no fractional, fractional reserve banking is actually, that should have been the goal. You put your money, you deposit in certificate of deposit. Today, they are called certificate of depreciation because the dollar <laughs> lose value. But uh, you could call them you know, a deposit and then it's locked up for five years. You can't touch it. And then the bank is allowed to make a loan for five years too. And most of those were to businesses. You know, real purpose, purpose where actually growth uh, was a target to improve because... Uh, if it was just for, ah, I want a car now, mm. and uh, you're doing this on a Bitcoin standard or on, at the time goal, the, the, you're, you're not going to have the benefit, added the benefit that your car loan after the fourth year is going to reduce because your salary will increase to adjust to inflation, but the debt is fixed. I mean, it's even more acute when you're looking at 30-year mortgage here in the US, which are possible, 30-year fixed mortgage. And so you could say after 20 years, you know, you, you know, the, the, the dollar is devalued so much and all, all those benefits. But um, so that is uh, if if you have uh, got a sound money, then loans will be really reduced to essential, not not someone who really wants, oh, I, I want a car now and that kind of thing. So there will mm -hmm. have been one of the benefits of overall, it will be way less malinvestment right up from very rare. They would still exist, but not mm. uh, as we see uh, a tremendous amount. And the second thing is um, it would have tied up the government in terms of um, all the interventions, uh, regulations, and uh, bailouts would not have been possible, um, all those things. So we, there's so many things that have been happening from the 1800s to today, uh, mostly mm. the 1900s, and war was so much easier back then too. Probably the World War One, World War II would not have been uh, as easy, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, not as long and not as uh, horrible. Yeah. But the... Um, so it's difficult to imagine how life would have been without that. But um, you know, but I can only imagine they would have been better uh, and improved. But definitely, you've got a point that um, uh, under the uh, 1800s didn't had all the um, uh, the benefits that we have today: running water, toilets, and all that. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, but when you you make abstraction of this this part, the the uh, the people could actually manage long term investment much more easier, mm -hmm. and, and the proof of that is uh, um, the defined benefits or defined uh, contributions that we have. Before it was defined benefits, Be government uh, sorry, businesses like IBM, whatever they could afford to say for uh, their. Employees, you know what? Uh, in their 1920s, 1930s, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna be, uh, we're gonna part of your salary. Um, we're actually gonna be using that. We're not gonna make it to you, but we'll put that in a fund, and you'll have 50% of your salary or 80% of your salary uh, later on. And it's managed. It was all possible. Why? And that's my major point: is that if you earn today, someone earns. Hundred thousand dollars per year, and they want to live comfortably with, say, one hundred thousand dollars per year when they retire in thirty years from now. They have no clue what inflation adjusted this one hundred thousand mm -hmm. should be in thirty years from now. I mean, it all depends on so much factors that are impossible to derive. Yeah. So that is one of the key that is uh, as opposed to a sum money because well one hundred thousand dollars 
per year today in 30 years with some money, it's still $100,000 per year, or maybe even less, because mm. now there will be even more uh, benefits, you know, and cars. Your technological uh, have... advancement and right. decreased yeah. price. Uh, you, you're into the Jeff Booth thesis, yes. yeah? Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And so that'll be, um, so you will probably need less, but the point is at least it's extremely easy to, to make your adjustment. And that's the reason why to define uh, contributions, uh, to define benefits that were the plans that uh, people had with their retirement with companies before as switch in the seventies to define ben uh, contributions for 1k, in the US, um, or RSP in Canada, and it probably is equivalent in Australia, uh, mm -hmm. where you, you put the money in mutual funds every year, every um, deposit of your, every check, and so on. Yeah. And then, um, so you define what you're going to be contributing, but you have no clue how much, how much will it be in 30 years. Yeah. Um, so yeah. they, these are the most horrible part of the system that we have right now. And uh, so, but, and the consequences that people don't realize that um, just to have a mathematicians uh, evaluating uh, statisticians, insurance providers to evaluate things in 20 years or 30 years adjusted for inflation, they have to make a real amazing, amazing, crazy guess in terms of, well, adjusted for inflation, what will it be in that inflation, you know? So that's yeah, the key point. Yeah, absolutely. And you see it playing out in real time. I remember starting to plan in my 20s and 30s because I was in the financial markets for a little while. In Australia, we just call it superannuation. And uh -huh. we, I was thinking ahead and, you know, trying to plan exactly that. You know, how much yeah. do I need? And I would assume a certain interest rate and go, yeah. well, if I had that much at that much interest rate, then I'd be able to retire. And I remember um, there's been a parallel because I remember when I first started saving for my first flat, my first kind of, you know, place I wanted to, to own. To live. And I remember the more I saved, the further out of reach the flats seemed to be. Mm -hmm. They they were getting more and more expensive. They were mm -hmm. increasing in price faster mm -hmm. than I could save. Mm -hmm. And so every time I thought I was getting a deposit together, it had stretched out of reach even further. And this is some decades ago. And mm -hmm. now that's the case for retirement. Yeah. Now it's like it doesn't matter how much you save. And I've done um, training work, which is the other kind of work that I do. And I've worked inside financial markets and superannuation companies. And one of the big phrases they have is, um, in terms of supporting people or educating everyday folk to save for retirement is one of their phrases is you don't want to run out of money before you run out of life. Yeah. Yes. And well, that's all very well, but it's, it's with, with inflation being impossible to, you know, to even, um, measure, let alone, so we can't even trust the numbers that we've got. Mm -hmm. You can't then estimate what it could be, let alone what it is on a compounding basis, let mm. alone what kind of interest rates you could expect on, let's say, a million dollars. Yeah. You know, if you if you can't trust that you'd get yeah. 2%. On top of that, you're taxed on your income, your revenue of well, the inflation. Uh, you're trying to, with the interest rate, to catch up with inflation at least. Yep. <laughs> And, and, and the fees from the superannuation fund, all of that stuff absolutely makes it just an impossible. And there's a mental load involved in that for people. And I think it may have been a comment that you made in your book, actually, which is consciously or unconsciously, we're mm. aware of this dilemma. Yes. And I think it's unconscious for many people. Remote, exactly. And yet they sense there's this sense. Yeah. They have to spend or they have to take a loan. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And the, yeah. the, the cards are stacked against them and there's no getting yeah. on top of it. Yeah. And there's let alone getting ahead of it. There's no getting yeah. ahead of it. Yeah. Um, there's no getting ahead. Yeah. Uh, and it really is uh, how much of society's, you know, you said you grew up in a, you know, very pro-business environment, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, 
how uh, and we've seen more and more kind of the left versus the right and everybody screaming and shouting at each other on twitter and these culture wars and whatever how much of it is just because everyone is just desperate there's a sense of desperation yeah. in the air yeah. because you cannot get ahead financially yeah a big factor for sure yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. so uh just tell me um okay so, so just let's to just come yes, back please. to a point that you mentioned you mentioned about the difficulty to evaluate one of the point i mentioned in my book is um obviously if you invest in a company providing dividends and and you know that company is going to go good, then you know, okay, and you, you might be protected in some way. I, I personally, I think you know, real estate isn't better for this. I suppose that you invest in a house, you put 20% down, and you've got a mortgage on it, and then you lease it, and the, le the rent is $2,000 per month. Yeah. And um, you've got, uh, you hold, hold it for 30 years. And so, but after the 30 years, uh, the mortgage is paid off. So now the $2,000 of rent uh, minus the insurance and the um, property taxes, all of it is yours. While in the beginning, most of it was uh, towards um, towards uh, mortgage payments. But at least it gives you an idea, okay, um, I need um six thousand dollars per month to live comfortably in 30 years then i'll buy i'll make sure i buy three three houses while well, it might be difficult for someone in, in in their 20s you just mentioned how difficult it is but um the point is i want to bring is for those who can at least have at least that amount of money to at least buy houses three houses and 30 years from they know exactly what will it be um you know, okay, that amount, regardless of what the inflation is. And that's assuming that the the neighborhood and on uh, the property in questions in a good city, good town, and then it will just maintain its value over time. Uh, it could be even higher because the demand or that property, then that, that, that town is a bit better than before in terms of uh, attraction and so on. And mm -hmm. uh, there's more people moving in, therefore property prices go, because we have to, it's so difficult because of the inflation, Oh, the property prices are, you know, a factor of 10 in uh, Sydney, Australia, compared to they were in, yeah, but okay, but if you adjust for inflation, uh, they're still higher. Mm. But but people do not fracture for inflation that easily, you know. More often, mm. they just use the, the dollar as if it was a ruler. And yeah. one of the arguments I mentioned is imagine that if a ruler, okay, I'm five feet nine. And next year, oh wow, I'm I'm five feet ten this year. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> you're you're grown up, but yet you know, the the ruler is shrinking. But everybody used that ruler as if it was fixed, and and you no, know, okay, you're five feet to eleven this year. Okay, good, and nobody flinched on that. And but it's ridiculous when you think about it. But now people keep doing it. But it's so ingrained because we're paid with that. Our salary is based on that. Everything. So they're forcing you to adapt to that ruler, not the ruler adapting to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You show. We were just talking before the show about how much I was impacted by that chart. I think it's on page twenty-eight in your book, um, oh, yeah. and it's from Gold. I'm just. I should have had it. Uh, yes. Oh, um, dog it. Here it is. Uh, so we us. were just saying it's from um, Gold Charts Are Us, uh -huh. and it shows um, yeah. the Dow Gold ratio. Correct. Yeah. During the Gold Standard Era, yeah. and then the Fiat Capital Era. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah, both yeah. showing it, we're both looking <laughs> okay. at it at the same yeah. time. Yeah. And what I find fascinating, and and hang on, and I want to liken this for a moment to something yeah. else. Yep. Yeah. I was looking up the other day inflation in gold era mm -hmm. versus in, inflation now. Is that what I was looking up? And inflation year on year actually was would fluctuate more one year to another in the gold era, but overall, because there was, you would actually feel the supply shocks. Mm -hmm. Um, but actually, overall, it was steady over the long term. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm kind of seeing here also. Well, no, this is actually, no, there's no, there's no analogy here. No, no. no. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. Yeah, that, <laughs> I thought there might be a likeness, wars and, um... but it's not, it's a separate issue. But really what we're seeing there is, mm -hmm. well, the consistency of gold to Dow in the gold yeah. era versus the Dow measured against gold in modern day era in fiat you know, yes. under a fiat standard. Yeah. So can we just speak to that for a moment? Because we're talking about the variables in property and, the, you know, the, the, it's the unpredictability. I think that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, the, the unpredictability, the inability to, to plan ahead to retirement, the mm -hmm. inability to make wise investment decisions because there's yep. too much unpredictability loaded into a fiat system. Can you talk to that for a moment uh, and as it relates to and how that comes to be, you know, how that chart ends up looking like that? Yeah. So one of the major problems that we have is uh, they're, they're drunken, they're more like a uh, Drunk drivers at the end, uh, at the at the wheel of a. Uh, it's an Australian thing. Um, what is it called again? A train train road, a train truck. You call oh, that? one of those three. Yeah, yeah, that trucks you, with the three across the country uh, with those things, and uh, but it's super long truck. Yes, and R like a road a train driver. or something they're called. Yeah, yeah. I, and it, this is what central bankers are basically because oh, uh, we oh, 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 we got a big recession. Oh, and working two thousand eight, you know. Oh, let's low interest rates. Oh, oh, now the low interest. Oh, now now we're now we've got a bubble. Oh, low, let's high, let's increase yeah. interest rates. When you look at this this thing, it's just like crazy. But the thing is, it affects the people because they don't understand the whole system how it is and it's the proof of debt and uh suddenly uh wow okay the um houses are cheaper uh, are, are more affordable because now the mortgage are cheaper money is cheaper and so they will they will be able to buy and not only that sometimes they have those plans where they can have near zero money down and all that. I mean, that, that was written pretty much crazy in 2007, 2008 in the US, not as much for other countries. But um, that is the uh, impact of that is that you throw in people that are losing because now they, they go through those things without knowing that, whoa, 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 you know, you've got the drunk driver and he's about to turn the wheel the other side because mm -hmm. he's about to veer off the road. And you just notice you're at the back of the road. You don't know what's going on for the regular people. And they get surprised by all this movement. And they all are actually, um, you know, um, they're it's not benefiting. They're affected by those. Uh, yeah. yeah. They're, you know, the victims of all these swings. With, yeah. because they actually don't uh, recognize those things and they don't see they don't understand the core of the problem and that's why they are uh, you know they, they're affected by that all the time and they're master of and it's that's the sad part is for their their system to sort of be more viable as long term they have to to manipulate the emotions and the mindset of the general populations in ways so that they can drive those things more easily. And, and you know, because if everybody, 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 or if everybody thought like us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they wouldn't be able to manipulate things as much, you know, and um, things will be uh, much more difficult for them. But um, the fact that so many people are not aware, uh, they can manipulate them. It's, that is the one thing that I found very sad in all that. Yeah. And, and yeah. in a movie, an example of the movie is, um, um, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, the big short. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, and it was, yeah. to me, it's funny that they actually allowed that movie to go on. I don't know, Hollywood and all that, you know, big actors and all that, but in some way, 
is just to, you know, uh, be, be careful, don't go full all in Bitcoin or whatever, because we can make the deflation again, or I, I don't know how this plays out, that they have played this, when the, when the release it was in 2012, just four years after, so maybe they, they, they just didn't want people to go overdrive uh, mm -hmm. on a new boom, but they just wanted it to more gradual increase. I have no clue, but they are master of manipulation. You talk about uh, you talk about apropos of that um, proof of debt. You talk about yeah. central bank proof of debt, which I think is a great phrase. Um, it feels to me like, and I'm not the history buff that I would like to be. There's a lot more I've, I've said I want to read, but it feels like coming out of the war, there was a whole lot of frenzy and activity and building and rebuilding. And, you know, so there was a whole lot of economic activity due to that. We still had some stability with some gold reserves, even though fractional reserve banking mm -hmm. was coming into play. Then you have obviously the Nixon shot in 1971, and it feels like we went on a massive sugar high mm -hmm. for probably 20 years. And it's funny because my son, who's in his teens yeah. says how good the music was back in the 70s and 80s and there was just mm -hmm. so much buzz mm -hmm. there was so much money finally just kind of released into the system in a mm -hmm. huge gush you know and yeah. then they've tried to as you say they're drunk steering this thing yeah. Yeah. um not having realized what they truly unleashed at that moment yeah. Yeah. and it was all fun and games there's um a, a phrase that goes around you know it's like 80 good 20 bad you know it can be about a relationship or it can be about a it can be about but it gets used a lot in relation to addiction so if you're drinking then 80 percent of your time drinking is good and 20 percent is bad then it becomes 70 good and 30 bad and then okay. it becomes 60 40 like 51 49 and there's a point at which it okay. switches over yeah. and now you know 40 percent of your time is is good and 60 percent, and you're trying to chase that dream and that's yeah. what it feels like to me has been happening since 71 that addiction to debt and that mm -hmm. addiction to money printing mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you, because you talk a bit about this a bit in your book, so can you just kind of expand on particularly the debt story and the debt spiral as you see it? Yeah. So one of the things that is fascinating when I, I, which I do mention is that people that are not, on, that have lived as an adult, not on a debt system, you know, something yeah. reasonable. And uh, we're talking about the 50s and early 60s, because even the late 60s was already starting to be a def almost like a fiat because they were they were printing for the moon missions and the uh, the Vietnam War and uh, everything yeah. happens in the U.S. because it was the uh, went Bretton Woods uh, and was flowing everywhere and they were exporting their inflation everywhere. So, but people it's you need to talk to people in the 80s or 90s to find someone who you know might remember uh how it was in his 20s when um you no know, prices were not moving up but you the window of time was just like 20 or 20 years of their, their life you know before it started to change and one of the argument at point is like you talk to someone in the 1950s or 60s that was 80 years old, he would have seen an odd dog at five cents all his life. And uh, so right up front, all of our generation, everybody we live, we are except, you know, very, very um, old people in the 90s or 80s, uh, pretty much everyone. Uh, I've lived through a fiat system and they don't know anything other than that. Or, you know, we can't really say what it used to be you know, before because we have never lived it. And that condition as well for those movement of high interest rates and low. And, and on top of that, when you look at this, the high interest rate of the 80s, since 1981, we have been in a bull market for the bond market. Yeah. The bond market have always gone up and up. I've always gone up 
since 1981 with variations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, and sometimes. And right now they look like, and everybody's sort of agreement that uh, things are about to change and we're going back into uh, a bear market for bond. Mm -hmm. And that will really shake up uh, what's going to happen because uh, suddenly one of the thing that people have been conditioned for the last 40 years is like uh, a good safe, safe haven is the bond market, treasury bonds, because overall, over the long term, it keeps going up because the interest rates have always went from 18% or 17% in 1981 under Reagan, all the way down to 0%. Um, um, so Volcker in 80, 17% to um, Bernanke and then um, uh, Yellen uh, at 0% or nearly 0% for the, um, for the phone rate, phones rate, you know. So uh, that once that change, people will have, uh, a switch in their mind from, well, the bond market's no longer safe. And that is starting to show up now. Yeah. So you've got a thing where people have always been conditioned for 40 years, and it's pretty much every adult that have been um, you know, investing in all that. And, well, okay, so now they have to consider something else than the bond market. What would it be? Traditionally, it has been gold and silver. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, what you saw in the 70s was a bear market for the bond market and the stock market. They typically go along and all that money went into gold and silver. And uh, but now now it's like the bubble is even bigger than it was in the 70s. And the situation is even more acute, and more horrible than it was in the 70s. And so the all that they had I had a chart before of the the bond market, the size of the bond market, which is you know ten times at least, or if not more. Um, I'm I'm not going to put the number because, but I know it's multiple factors, more than ten of the gold of the gold market. Um, so if you market cap of gold versus the market cap of all the bond, uh, it's way more uh, bigger. But now you're going to see that, and they're going they will want to be moving to something like gold. So yes, part of that will go to gold because some are just not going to be interested in something digital, whatever, and they're baby boomers, um, pick, a, pick a name. But um, what is going to be interesting is that Bitcoin is so small compared to gold, factor of 20 in terms mm -hmm. of market cap, because you can't compare, compare Bitcoin uh, in terms of price. Okay. Wow, it is so amazing when Bitcoin uh, was $900 and gold was at $900. We got parity, one ounce of gold. Yeah, who cares? They're, you're measuring horses and, and lettuce or yeah. completely unrelated things. But in market cap, yes, the size of the market of Bitcoin is 20 times smaller than that of gold. It will have to be around $600,000 per Bitcoin to match that of gold. And that's what I expect is going to happen. And a time of crisis, it'll be like this. But then what will happen in people's mind that they have been traditionally investing in gold to look at that is like, wow, uh, now we've got the contender. You know, I get Bitcoin is just as big as a market as gold. And that translates to the stability that we've seen in gold. Mm -hmm. Compared to when you, um, yeah, the, the stability of gold compared to the dollar, you can say, oh, it's not, it's volatile. You're going to see all those stupid articles about that. Yeah, okay, it's because we're not using gold as our medium of exchange for salaries and all that. But when you consider that um, when we have a compare gold in the commodities, they're relatively not going too far off from one to the other, you know? And suddenly you they'll consider, well, now Bitcoin has the same market cap. So that would be the same thing with Bitcoin. Market, it'll be much more stable as a, as a safe haven Bitcoin because it's a size, a small market. And the reason you look at silver, you know, it's a way smaller market silver than, uh, than gold. It's tiny, yeah. tiny uh, market. So obviously it changes a lot and compared to gold. 
So you make an assignment analogy. Once Bitcoin gets that, that will be a mindset shift. So we've got those two going on. Really and truly. And of course, the whole point is you don't want to wait until it gets to that before you start investing, because <laughs> by then it's 600,000, you know. So what do you want to do? Wait until it's actually yeah. hit that mark. But well, I think the point, sorry, yeah. go on. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, to, to point that out is that, uh, yeah, people might say, well, it's 600,000 is very expensive, but uh, that will be matching the price of gold, which also both of them will be a fraction of the bond market. And if yeah. all that money that is in bond market is going away because everybody's panicking out of the bond market, so all that huge column of bond versus tiny column of gold and, and Bitcoin, that shrink and that has that wealth is going to transfer away to Bitcoin and gold. And so there'll be a fight maybe in some way, but you know I'm not going to see... I'm not in those crazy mode of people big hyper Bitcoinization where gold is going to go to zero or whatever their uh, their arguments. Uh, I'm not sure what price they can imagine. There's just no way that gold is going to go to zero. You know, there will still be people that have say, see that as a, another form of um, of safety. You know, uh, but um, uh, but Bitcoin is going to be suddenly a big big contender. Are you or your loved ones looking to secure and manage your Bitcoin with confidence? The Bitcoin Advisor is your premier destination for professional Bitcoin management, helping you buy, secure and manage your Bitcoin so you can own intergenerational wealth and sleep easy. With a reputation built on unparalleled security, strategic planning and comprehensive client education, the Bitcoin Advisor team have managed over $1 billion in assets without losing a single Satoshi since 2016. Whether you're new to Bitcoin or a seasoned investor, the Bitcoin Advisor team are there to guide you every step of the way. So please click on the link below to organize yourself a consultation and include the name Carrie, C-A-R-R-I, in the referral code so that they know that I've sent you their way. Well, what we're seeing is a whole reorganization of what we have traditionally thought of as risk on and risk off assets. And yeah. to the degree that, uh, you know, a safe portfolio has always been 60, 40 uh, mm -hmm. bond shares yeah. uh, and, and, you know, to whatever degree fixed interest is thrown into the ring as well. These yeah. days, it, bond, what you're fundamentally saying and what we're seeing talked about increasingly in mainstream media is that bonds are now risk on. And if gold is the only risk off, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for international trade. It doesn't work mm -hmm. um, for for practical individual purposes if I want to move. So you and I started yeah. talking yeah. before the show, before we started recording about that very practical issue of getting it, of it transferring a, it overseas. Yeah, and yeah we it needs a derivative. About, yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Um, if you want the actual physical, if you don't want a certificate, if you want the physical gold, and that's problematic for people escaping yeah. war zones, and it's problematic for anyone just wanting to transfer their wealth, frankly, from mm. one side of the continent to the other. You know, if you yeah. moved from Quebec to the, you know, West Coast, and how do you take your gold? Are you going to keep it yeah. safely in your car? Or are you going to take it on the plane you've got to take it through all customs and security mm -hmm. you know all of that yep. stuff it's yep. a gold's a nightmare you know yeah. let alone for international trade purposes yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yet the gold bug there, there will always be gold hard uh, sorry die hard gold bugs mm. um do you come across many of them and, and have you ever converted any no uh no and <laughs> and um the uh yeah i follow uh a few um that are you know i used to at least that's uh, and there were some very good they're very sharp but they're stuck on uh goal and oh they they love the blockchain but for using uh, a representation of goal uh, that is fine. You know, if you could back this up, they they have to see this backing by gold. Otherwise, for them, it's digital air. That's mm -hmm. that's essentially the their message is the core message is just that. You know, well, mm -hmm. I can't. It's not tangible. You know, I mean, well, 
I mentioned that in the, in the book. And it's like uh, this is the definition of uh, Menger versus uh, uh, that is okay. It has saleability. Money came up from something that has saleability and then becomes uh, uh, it's being used as in, as usage and uh, utility and then used as money. While Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises said, well, actually, it's anything that the money uh, that um, is convenient as money that the market decide to use as money. And, uh, you know, um, you've probably saw the chart of uh, I had fun with that because I, I put this um, this cartoon at the end just to come back and remind. And that's really addressing the uh, so it's addressing the uh, the gold bugs. Because now this is a oh, gold. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Carrying yeah. oil in your pocket yeah. to pay for gold. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we know that gold coins, they're both utilities, but we know why gold was chosen uh, because of its convenience as money. And that's the part about convenience as money. It's all relevant to the market. They don't care about utility. Mm, absolutely. So uh, let's just... Can you're an investor? Tell me about your portfolio structure, roughly. Can you give me? If we're not doing sixty forty bonds shares these days, you're a real estate mm -hmm. investor. Have been, yeah. You know, yeah. from early on. I yeah. look at Lynn Alden's public portfolio, and it's still only a percentage that's in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, she's still heavily invested in. Well, hers is shares because it has to be, you, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, you're looking more broadly, I don't think she talks about her real estate. But would you put, without telling us your personal situation, but uh, how would you look at the, if you were looking for a low risk option, we're talking about yeah. risk off assets here. Yeah. If you're looking for a low risk option for a 10 to 20 year investment. How so, would you weigh yeah. your portfolio these so It days? all depends on the you know, the person, you know, if I was advising a friend, you know. Because um, mm -hmm. it, it all depends on um, there's a combination of factors. For example, well, do you have a job or do you want to be, you know, um, you know, surfing the world and so on? And so obviously all in Bitcoin and just pure capital gain and selling. That's one way. But um, the other is actually to own real estate. And then the real estate, the assets is um, giving you uh, income. Um, but the problem is with the business, Austrian school business cycle, real estate, as well as bond and the stock market, the, yep. these three factors will take a dive because real estate is mostly based on the economy, when you've got high inflation and low interest rate going up, uh, then the mortgage go up. And so it affects real estate. They're flat right now, but people have not realized how much impact it is. And you might see a, a trash real estate eventually, you know, soon. Mm -hmm. So you invest in that knowing that, well, it's going to be, so if you look at it for 20 years, that's different, but do you understand that, um, it's in terms of um, value, it will dip down. So as long as at least the security of the and the income coming from that, the cash flow, um, the um, investment will still be able to finance itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the key, you know. And so these are the factors that I have to take in consideration. And so right now we're a very, very critical point to mention because of the bond market and so on that... Uh, uh, someone doesn't care, does a job, well, well, said, well, then focus on Bitcoin and uh, mostly. And um, and you can, yeah, if you want, you can also consider silver. And the reason I mentioned silver is because uh, mm. the the ratio is completely distorted for, for silver compared mm -hmm. to, um, it's a long story, but... Um, but the the point is uh, the you know the, the 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 focus should be in the equivalent of gold and, and uh, today it's more like Bitcoin but you know they could still have some goals here if they want but that is where uh, where things going to be shifting from the bond market and stock market mostly I believe from the bond market into those safe haven so that's mm. why 
that perspective is like, okay, I know that's where I should focus because um, there's uh, until they reset money, you know, they, they flush out the system of the debt, which in some way that was happening with the high interest rate in the 80s and suddenly, and what will happen is that once we do this the reset, interest rate will be high indeed. Because the reason why is when there's been so much uh, mal malinvestment and so on, there's a, uh, that the swing has to be the other way. You know, it'll be high interest rates. So until we get to that point where suddenly now interest rate can go back down regularly, and hopefully for unsound money, it will stabilize. You know, it's not going to be doing all those things or artificially low. And the fact it's low, then it's going to be crashing up. You now, they're they're making those artificially pushing to the extreme the system which create those swings that are like the chart, the dollar gold ratio. We see these things swinging even more because they are exaggerating even more with 0% interest rate. That means it's even more crazy than what they did in the 60s and 70s in terms of low interest rate. Mm -hmm. There's even more distortion this time. So it's going to be even worse than what happened in the late 70s. Pretty concerning. Um, you're not a fan of of central authorities. You're clearly not a fan of central banks and their drunk driving. Uh, <laughs> you grew up um, anti-socialism, and you uh, refer joyfully to in your book to the securities and uh, sorry, securities and exchange cartel. You call it. <laughs> uh, that is what they are. Yeah. That is what they are. So um, in this era, as we are of centralization since, you know, post World War Two, mm -hmm. uh, what's been the history? We, we've got a sense of the history of money since that time. We've got a bit of a sense of the central bank history since that time. What's the history of the SEC and how did it come to be what it yeah. is today? Because it's not what it started off as. Yeah. So, well, it might have started this way uh, <laughs> with that purpose. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So it's coming from the 1930s under FDR, um, which is one one of the worst presidents, in my opinion. <laughs> he's not the worst, but he's among the worst. <laughs> um, so, um, so the, um, yeah, the purpose for that is to protect and what is funny is like I look at people in Germany, they're allowed to uh, invest in ICOs, um, you know, bad or good. They yeah. were allowed to. They were allowed to go to Binance. They're like, US, uh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, you're not allowed this, 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 this. So the, in the land of the free and home of the brave, uh, because of the SEC, there's a lot of things that um, they're in, the Americans are not allowed, American resident, citizens and residents. And uh, so the um, that is the purpose of that. Well, official purpose is to protect people uh, from uh, you know, and to have anyone who wants to make a uh, public offering or shell, sell shares to the public, they have to go through a CC for approval, and they need to hire expensive firms and law firms that will craft the paperwork. So there's a lot of overhead that goes into those the, this process before it goes to uh, to public. So a company really chuck off a big chunk of their of their um, capital just to be mm -hmm. able to go public. Second thing is um, many of the time the it gives an advantage to accredited investors and accredited investors in us is um, people that have um, a, an income over uh, $250,000 or $500,000 mm -hmm. for a couple or a million dollars in net worth, uh, in excluding their house. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is really restricting. So imagine if that was the case with Bitcoin uh, in the first, I don't know, picking five years. Uh, no, uh, uh, nobody, right. only accredited investors could invest in Bitcoin. Uh, could have a mining rig, uh, you know, to, uh, that is, this is, uh, this is ridiculous. And, and the thing, the other thing is to flip on that. 
Look at um, Facebook, for example. There were a bunch of accredited investors and connected investors that were able to invest in uh, Facebook before the IPO. And in fact, it's, it's like this for every IPO. And they're able to invest. And now it goes on the public and with the IPO, and now they can sell. And that, that includes also the law firm that will take care of making crafting paper or they know it's going to be accepted. They buy share or they, you know, they, you know, they, they probably be able to get those shares and then able to sell. So, so how different is that from those ICOs where you had those, <laughs> you see what I'm talking about them? Huh? Yeah. But yeah. it's, um, but, oh, the fact it's approved by the SEC, uh, it gives a false sense of, um, uh, security for the public mm -hmm. yes and, and that's to me uh and not, not only that but it's also and it's in reality it's more like to help a group of um, a cartel basically uh, really benefit from those things i mean it's they're not necessarily you know with a label cartel but i mean it's it's a group of uh you know the law firms involved with those things and it's fluid in terms of that term, but the point is there's a really a subset of the population that can, and a big, larger subset of the population are not allowed to benefit from um, those early investment. And yeah, absolutely. That is absolutely. one of the reasons. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you talk about in your book or you tell the story of, which I actually really didn't have the background on, is... Uh, and of course, we've just seen partial resolution of this recently, is mm. XRP and mm. um, and uh, what the way you describe the story of what happened there, it sounds like, like they've really been singled out for incredibly unfair um, uh, handling by the SEC. Yeah. Is, so, is, yeah. is that what, have I understood that correctly? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Although there is some conspiracy, um, uh, Bitcoiners, yes, that I have um, with tinfoil hat, or maybe with good reasons, maybe. Because <laughs> when you look, uh, when you read something like this book, yeah, uh, Federal Reserve. Just to small parentheses here, when you look at the uh, the creation of Federal Reserve, um, the bank who crafted the Federal Reserve Act, a group of bankers, they came out publicly saying, oh, no, that's not good. That is um, bad for business, for our business, this Federal Reserve Act. They pretend they don't like it. Mm -hmm. And then people say, oh, okay, the banks don't like it. Oh, that must be good for us. You know, okay, so that helped actually make it law. You know? <laughs> so the question is, you know, you look at this kind of pattern of deception, yeah. Um, oh, two years ago, we know that some point in the future we'll need that two, three years ago. We'll we'll actually do a lawsuit against Ripple and all that. Uh, and then oh now they and I and they say it, the, the XRP fans, they're saying, Oh, that's the only coin with with uh, legal clarity right now. Look at that. You know, it's the only coin with legal clarity in the US. How Good was that, you know. They had to go through two years where a bunch of insider could have accumulated during that time, because the price went down. And, you know, once the once the and I predicted, you know, probably going to win. And yeah, there probably is a trade with this because yeah, it went up eighty percent once they approved <laughs> this thing. And I yeah. was predicting it'll be approved, and yeah, it got a. Um, they had clarity. It's not fully clear the rest uh, what's going to happen, but the major point of it is uh, there might be a small uh, amount of, um, I mean, we're talking millions, but um, of um, penalty towards Ripple uh, for uh, for the rest of the story. But the, the major point is all those coins are now suddenly the Coinbase and all the uh, all the exchange can list it back and that one they're not afraid to list it anymore and uh, how convenient is that and so so that's that's one now i'm gonna close the <laughs> pieces on that yeah and if i cover instead now the uh the fact that um 
uh, yeah, they overall, what I found sad, and it's just an example of a CC, they haven't done anything with uh, Ethereum ICO. Yeah. They have not done, and they didn't say, we're warning you, we see what you're doing. Uh, we see clearly, uh, yeah, it's not good. You shouldn't do this because, uh, you know, we're going to go after you later on, whatever. Or by not doing this, you get a frenzy of ICO that came up. All the other, a bunch of, I, I, I could do that too. I don't know, I, Ethereum has done that. Let's do an ICO. It's, uh, it seems like SEC is not barking at those things. So we can, so that actually helped the frenzy that we had in 2017 because suddenly it looks like SEC has no, no problem with this. Yeah. So yeah. one factor. Second, second thing that I don't like is they, do you have those investors? Because unfortunately, many uh, retail investors that were invested in XRP, they just panic. And when the uh, lawsuit came up, they they were holders. They they had that, and suddenly, um, you know, at this point, they see it. It's been around for seven years, and the SEC has never done anything. And suddenly, the SEC is acting now in twenty twenty, uh, December twenty twenty. Uh, for what they've done, you know, in seven years earlier or six years earlier, whatever, crazy, crazy when you think about it. Mm. For nobody's yelling, nobody was barking, nobody was um, barking about the LBRI, also the same thing. And there's so many cases where they go after the company, and actually, the people that are investing, there were no complaint or they were happy. Sure, they've done it. I've shown an example where they actually went after a crazy guy who actually was in full fraud. Um, I'm not sure if you saw that one. Uh, yeah. If you remember, I uh, forgot the name of that uh, coin, but it was supposedly, it was completely ma made up story that uh, oh, there'll be, um, I think it was uh, one of the retail shop company, a major retail company in the US, I think it was... Uh, Bed Bath and Beyond, or I can't remember. Oh yeah, be yes. using their their product uh, to, to track ownership, uh, the um, the own the um, the buyers and something like this, and it was all made up. But again, it's not the SEC that needed to be created to tackle those things. This was fraud, and people complain, you know. That, and there were fraud laws before, yeah. but at least they went after that. And they, uh, but obviously, by the time they've done that, uh, they were they are not any faster than any other cases. So, uh, yeah, the damage was done. You know, you would think by having this entity, they will be proactive and they will, you know, be able to get this before there's any damage done. Yeah. Yeah, what's the point? But, but you've got Enron, you've got uh, Madoff, all those things. People are barking to the SEC. Watch this guy. Check this out. There's something wrong. And the SEC, you know, a few months or a few years after they act on it. It's just yeah. ridiculous. Really and seems quite a mention and that when you rely when you rely on somebody to watch, to care for you and stuff, taking responsibility yourself, you know, you're putting yourself in danger. We shouldn't have that, um, this entity. Well, that's right. Cause you, I mean, it keeps circling back to that thing of you said right at the beginning where you might've had small banks, small regional banks falling over due to fractional reserve banking mm -hmm. back in the yeah. gold standard days, yeah. but at least it was spot fires. Yes. Um, it didn't have a chance to accumulate into, yeah. uh, you know, a major bushfire, yeah. but, you know, yeah. so the, the yeah, idea. Affecting everyone. Yeah, that's right. And it feels like with the SEC, it's almost as if, it's almost as if whatever central authorities do, It's like whatever the opposite of the Midas touch is, you know, it turns, <laughs> you know, yeah. turns to rubbish. Yeah. I just had a libertarian on the show who yeah. said basically the things we complain about most are like health and education, the things that are provided for by mm. public service, by central yeah. authorities. Yeah. Um, if you have a problem with a private goods or service, you, you go elsewhere, you know, there's yeah. competition yeah. and yes. they, there's checks and balances. 
provided by that competition. One of the, uh, I'm just going to come to for a moment, kind of really the crux of your book in many ways. So uh -huh. what happens for a lot of Bitcoiners, as we know, is they come across crypto in inverted commas. It's all mm. one big barrel of just, you know, mm. 20,000, mm. 30,000 projects out there. Bitcoin yeah. isn't clearly differentiated in their minds for a lot of us when we first move into this space. Mm. Then we kind of do the unraveling and so forth. And many end up, particularly if you got burnt, you know, by yeah. the FTX, you yes. know, Sam Bankman yeah. Fried or Mashinsky or whoever, you end up becoming a Bitcoin maxi. And, and mm -hmm. you know, the saying goes toxic Bitcoin maxi. Mm -hmm. So the argument for many toxic Bitcoin maxis is there's no such thing as an altcoin use case. Like there's nothing real in that space. You beg to differ. So... Tell me more about how you see the altcoin. Yeah. Well, beg to differ. Um, <laughs> as it is, their their value on what has been going on um, in there. Let's let me give two examples. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, uh, the concept of um, zero knowledge proof is something yeah. fascinating to me. And how it is and so on. And I believe that um, this in some form or another might get its way into a layer two Bitcoin or uh, a side chain of Bitcoin or perhaps the layer one of Bitcoin. You know, I have no you, clue. You give it, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, Phil, but you give quite a good explanation of zero proof knowledge in here. And um, for listeners, would you mind uh, yes, breaking that down for us, please? Yes, 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 yes. So this the essential of zero knowledge proof. It's mathematical proof where I could prove to you, for example, that I have these coins uh, yeah. uh, without showing you uh, that I. Uh, it's I'm making a proof and giving you a proof um, without giving you and um, showing you that I actually know it. No, not mm -hmm. I'm not showing you how I know it. All, all you'll be able to come out of this is that, yeah, I know he knows. I don't know more than just that. He knows. He clearly knows. He yeah, clearly knows it's about obvious. This, the this evidence stuff. is there that yeah. he knows, but yeah. I don't have the background as to kind of. So, <laughs> yeah, and the example that is typical that is given in the literature, and it's, I think it's a French mathematician who came up with uh, this concept of uh, a man in a cave from so it's actually this little chart. There. Oh, that's right. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. Yeah, it's yeah, a great, yeah, yeah. it's a great chart. Oh, yeah. It's a great description. Yeah, yeah. But um, obviously, you read this. It's like, okay, but why? Uh, why he didn't? Why did Victor didn't just say bluntly, uh, uh, see which door she was about to get in? I'll just yeah. show it for people. Maybe you can talk us through it. So, Victor. Uh, Peggy will choose a path A or B, and Victor uh, will then enter, and he doesn't know if she put uh, she chosen A or B, and he will randomly say, "Okay, come back by A." So she might have been lucky and went through A, and so and she never had to cross the door. So he, he doesn't know her that. So that's why it's, it will be repeated multiple times. So that's the general mathematical representation. Now someone will say, "Well." Why not did uh, Victor see which path she went? And he will say, ask for the opposite. Oh, she entered by B. Now I'm going to say, come by A. And now I know she went through the door. But um, the reason it is the way it is, is just to actually represent how mathematically the proof, the, 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 the proof is given, is ran and it's uh, created, basically. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's um, the same concept. So therefore, they have to, um, part of the proof is multiple um, repetition that is done yeah. to give an, a, a certainty that, uh, yeah, she really knows it. But the part of it, the zero knowledge proof, and that's, for example, Zcash and Monero, they use that kind of concept. And so that uh, 
these are there's no blockchain where you can see movement and all that it's all, all obscure because now it's just all about this this movement of uh, proof a zero knowledge proof that is going on as the way to transfer transactions now it's um i have no clue how this could translate in some way but we've been so much surprised by those just in the bitcoin world first of all in 2007 and anyone would come up and say, well, we're going to have a digital currency where the supply will be fixed. Nobody's controlling it and it'll be a fixed amount. And anyone could be transferring those things using their private key. No, says, <laughs> no way, no way. And it's impossible. Paper comes up. Wow. And then open the light bulb. Everybody's amazed. Now it's like, OK, it's a very nice Bitcoin, but the transaction speed is not there. There's no way we're going to be able to do it. Now, how are we going to make things? Are we going to have to increase the block size and all that? Suddenly, the Lightning Network comes up. So what is not to say that in five or 10 years, there's something out of zero knowledge proof that makes its way for a certain purpose like trading or uh, I don't know. Actually, mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to try. But yep. the point is, I, that's one of the arguments. So they might say this now. They might be surprised in five or ten years that, holy shit, uh, that thing. Uh, yeah, it makes sense to. We have it in layer two now, and it's super thing. And the other thing that I found cute and interesting, that it's rough. I think it's more like a draft, and it needs to be improved. And there's certainly lots of um, way to improve it. Is um, the uh, Uniswap um, smart contracts on Ethereum, where you can exchange with a smart contract. You you transfer your um, um, stable coins, and you buy uh, you can can buy uh, WBTC wrap Bitcoin, for example. Or mm -hmm. I'm picking those two yep. together, and so there it's completely decentralized because you know you're just sending that to the address of a contract and that the contract is then spitting out uh, and then forwarding that back to your address uh, those those coins uh, the 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 opposite you know the, of the trade and uh, so that's very crude the way it is because it's money market uh, fund it's basically based on the pool and, and we go through that in the book but um I expect that there'll be much more evolved versions uh, in the future uh, that uh, because we see FTX is an, an example of well bad things can be with exchanges um, and so uh, if we have for example eventually a hyper bitcoinization world where mm -hmm. bitcoin is the only currency in the world and um but a company wants to, you know, I want to have my shares available and they'll be represented as tokens in some way on them. Mm -hmm. And um, people can get those shares uh, through those things and they'll be able to uh, trade those with those smart contracts so they don't have to stress about having this into a, uh, a uh, an exchange somewhere or so on. Now, obviously it comes with the same drawback that we have with Bitcoin. Uh, you die, uh, your Bitcoin are lost unless you have your private key and all that. So if you have the tokens of shares, then you have to also have the same, uh, you know, making sure that you're not losing your keys and so on. But um, the same principle apply in terms of um, key management. You know, that's one the thing that uh, is still needs a lot of improvement on the Bitcoin world to make things uh, more solid and all that. Uh, and I expect, all, again, I'm sure that in, within five, 10 years, maybe, we'll have new development in terms of how we manage. We have multi-sigs. That is one of the way. But um, a combination of multi-sig and some uh, other phenomenon that could uh, make things even more easier in terms of management. Because the benefit that we have, as bad as the system is, with um, if you have in your stocks, your shares on a on an exchange, is that um, you know you 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 have an accident, and whatever it happens, you lose your memory 
whatever mm -hmm. you you still have you know you you go to uh, the company will we'll obviously you've got your id and all that they'll be able to you know to transfer that to you or reset your password that kind of thing you know but these are things that it's not something that we have in the bitcoin world right now and they have all that flexibility but we we don't know how things could be um, more improvement there too so anything is up to for grass and for the future and uh, we could be really surprised yeah absolutely and this is how i really like you set up the altcoin market there's there's two things you said that really struck me one was we claim to be freedom loving people there should be freedom to experiment yeah. and to come up with your own coin and explore yeah. a new technology or a new idea uh, but the other point that you made was that it almost serves as, which is really what you're describing now, an experimental playground whereby people are exploring and experimenting with different technologies that may or may not prove useful to Bitcoin in the future, which is really what you're giving an example of at this point mm -hmm. in time, how, how zero knowledge may or may not ultimately end up yeah. being useful to Bitcoin core devs. So... And, you know, and sidechain, so, you, you you know, obviously Lightning and um, Liquid. Um, Liquid Network, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which so, is using LBTC as a sidechain of Bitcoin. Absolutely, absolutely. Which is so, experimenting using Bitcoin uh, derivatives. Yeah. Well, that's right. You know, I mean, it's a very kind of creative and involving early space, you know, mm -hmm. and it, anything could be useful here. Yeah. Uh you you put forth a, a reasonable defense, I would say, of proof of stake. Mm. Uh, and yet, I think as someone who went down with Mashinsky, um, uh, I the thing that I found most difficult was and, and I had my doubts about Mashinsky and then I got talked out Mashinsky. of them so I'm sorry Mashinsky. by various influences what is and Mashinsky? so I uh, uh you know that uh, that was a useful lesson in its own right but he would try to explain staking rewards and how we were earning yield and it never fully made sense to me and that was part of my my doubts mm -hmm. you explain it better than Mashinsky does I'm but I sure can't who help Mashinsky who, who sorry is, who is Mashinsky? oh sorry Alex Mashinsky Celsius so okay okay yeah so um they were offering reward okay. you know they were just offering yeah. high staking rewards oh. on multiple coins and yeah. as far as I know, the most recent news is he's going to court. He's going to jail. I think it's uh -huh. actually. Yeah, well, if it's a high yield, it might smell like fraud. Yeah, absolutely. In, in an environment of cheap uh, interest rate, the, the, the market will adjust. If something is truly legitimate and as a high yield, everybody's going to go there and bring the yield lower. Yeah. You know, yes. it's just a matter. So right. whenever it's high, it's, there's fraud and more likely. <laughs> so just talk me through a little bit of proof of stake, because um, clearly it's been deeply rejected by the Bitcoin world. Yeah. Um, I don't know that there's as many maxis in the space as appear to be the case. I think some people quietly hold other coins on the side but would mm -hmm. never speak up about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so just tell me a little bit about your understanding. Yeah, of, so, um, and, and I mentioned, I guess. yeah, I, I'm going to mention right up front that um, um, one, I actually envision, and I mentioned that somewhere in the book, that uh, there could be eventually a, a more decentralized sidechain because like uh, a liquid network, there mm -hmm. are, um, proof of authority like xrp you know it's a yeah. group of people that are running nodes and they're all known to each other and um, yeah uh, but i what i can see is uh eventually a side chain and i the ideal side chain is that you could really transfer your bitcoin 
the representation of the a creating a derivative of your Bitcoin that will be frozen on the main chain. You cannot move them. Otherwise, if your currency Bitcoin can move, and then it's not a side chain, it's an altcoin. You know, it has to be fixed Bitcoin that are represented on the side chain while they are represented on the side chain. And uh, so imagine a uh, side chain there where it's possible to do that without um, with through a decentralization smart contracts of some sort. Um, mm. This that's it, that's the case. Now you have a side chain, and the best side chain I imagine uh, would be you could you cannot use proof of work. We only want one single proof of work chain and that is bitcoin now every other currency right now that you're using proof of work is not ideal because now you want all the energy focus on bitcoin uh and they're subject to the 51 percent by bitcoin miners even though they might not using the same ash algorithm uh it will be you know the amount of massive energy that is there that could be redirected anyway and create a 51 percent attack so the side chain will have to be something else than proof of work. Proof of authority is not good. Uh, proof of stake to me would be a perfect way. With the distinction, there's no uh, rewards. The only thing that the, that the uh, people that will be involved um, that are the node operators that are the miners will be only making money through transaction fees and that's it. And it's because they can't, they can't create more Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But uh, then they'll be able to experiment and all that. Any kind of craziness will not affect Bitcoin because it's only about the uh, the uh, the Bitcoin that have been moved there, uh, and they they might come back in, through um, a hack, someone whatever that is, you know. But Bitcoin's blockchain was never affected by whatever shenanigans or whatever problem, the craziness you know, might happen. Or if it's good, it's good. But the point is, that's one thing I see. The proof of uh, stake, yeah, there's been a lot of ba bad rap. But I was trying to, at some point, it's like, you know, I, I need to understand fully how it works. And because mm -hmm. there's no point. And that's part of my book. And it's like, you can't be barking at something if you don't fully understand the full demand fundamental. Yeah. And um, and so yes, there's a plenty, plenty of them out there, and um, uh, variations of proof of stake. You know, so uh, the one I use mm -hmm. is uh, Tezos, but um, what I like about it is that many of the arguments don't fall for it in the sense that oh, uh, it's um. Because uh, one of the things is pretty much everybody can delegate and can operate and benefits from the creation of new tokens on that chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, through the rewards. So that's the one thing. That being said, um, proof of stake is more complex. There's more parts, more moving parts. And the more complex something, the more danger it is for a flaw or a problem, either now or down the road. Uh, that can affect it. So that's why proof of work is more safer. Uh, and that's why I'm definitely uh, in favor that Bitcoin should remain proof of work. Who cares the um, global warming, whatever. First of all, I don't believe that. I think the, the sun has way more to do and the cycles of the sun has that way more to do with anything on earth. But that's beyond the talk. <laughs> the, um, the point is... Um, Proof of work is simpler, and I'm convinced that if somehow there was um, Satoshi's twin came up with the same white paper with proof of stake, and we had two, and then we had those two together, uh, proof of work would have won, um, been uh, dominant for the safety that is uh, and the conservatism that you can get from proof of work being much simpler, much less complex, much uh, basically. Uh, uh, less dangerous of possible problem. I mean, I mean, you can explain easily proof of work to someone, uh, you know, once they understand SHA-256, how it is, pretty much they understand 90% of the, 95% of how Bitcoin works, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, they have to understand the race and all that and all that, but, you know, you can explain it. 
proof of stake is uh, no. Uh, there's um, it's a little bit more complex. You you it will take you at least three times the time than uh, to explain for Bitcoin. You know. Yeah. Okay. So tell me because uh, it feels like we're getting to time. You know, we've been chatting for quite a while. Uh, if you had to sum up, having gone down the journey of writing this book, having even gotten to the point of making a decision that this book is worthwhile, then going down the substantial time and effort of putting the book together on behalf of kind of newcomers to help clear some mm -hmm. of this stuff up. Uh, and the differentiation between the two. Tell me what kind of conclusions you come to by the end at this stage and where you are in life, having completed this book and published it, having assimilated all that additional research you would have had to do mm. in order to really nut out the detail of some of the book. Yeah. Um, where are you at now with it all? So, yeah, so the, it, the book basically, uh, the reason why I, first of all, I wrote the book was that I um, really wanted to shed some lights on for many of the different groups of people, you know, altcoiners, bitcoiners, and gold bugs and all that, to bring up to what is actually all the pieces. Let's bring everything on the table and look at it and uh, just check out what is going on overall and see what it, and to me, because I saw so many people. Um, and particularly altcoiners and gold bugs with um, wrong statements about Bitcoin that I felt like uh, there needs to be clarity and to make, to explain things how it is. After doing the book and coming to conclusions and so on, uh, it was, yeah, it was an interesting journey because I had to try to be as unbiased as possible I wanted to be somewhat of unbiased and to um, so it's like arguing against myself, creating two versions of me and yeah. it's like, well, 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 with Bitcoin, you could do that, but then you do this and uh, yeah, okay. But yeah, so it really is <laughs> funny, <laughs> yeah. but, but the, uh, what I see is that uh, where it'll be an interesting journey in what we can have and, what is so fun to see is that one chart will tell us a little bit how things will play is uh, the Bitcoin uh, dominance charts. You know, will it go back eventually, go back up and in, uh, in 20 years from now, slowly back to 95, 98, 100%. You know, at what rate is going to do those things? You know, what are uh, major events would could accelerate this change? And for example, a major crisis worldwide, and suddenly uh, major company uh, countries decide to go on the Bitcoin standard. They kick mm -hmm. in the hyper Bitcoinization by having, you know, three, four, five. Elsa Dormit start started to think because they already are on uh, using the dollar and Bitcoin as um, as a um, equal tender. So. If the dollar is really starting to be going into an hyperinflation, well, we're just going to drop this thing and just looking at Bitcoin, you know, it'll be easy for them, you know. But then you've got that process is where if it's only one one uh, currency, Bitcoin, that is being used in a given country as an equal tender, uh, it's another thing that will push up, accelerate this, this Bitcoin dominance charts. So... I have no clue how things will play out, mm. but to me, and that, these are the thing that is I found interesting. What's going to happen? How things will play for that? Um, so I, uh, I'm going to definitely look at that and how things. The but on the meantime, and in certain countries, uh, probably including the U.S., where the the one point and someone sh showed that chart to me uh, uh, on Twitter. I, I had seen it before. The amount of trading and activity and speculations and variation of gold measure in the Dutch mark in 1922, in 1921, 1922, 22, and 23 was remarkable. 
gold could crash 50% in a day or in a week against the Dutch mark only to regain by a factor of five, you know, and then like the next week, you know, and that kind of thing, the movement were drastic. How would those people that are living through these horrible things, they had to concentrate a heavy portion of their time to speculations rather than actual, actual economic activity. So the German economy suddenly before being you know, 90%, 10% financial and 90% on real economic activity, creating food and supply and anything, you know, suddenly that shrunk because you know everybody had to work and focus on keeping their uh, their um, their their purchasing power and some of that was like oh yeah i'm going to trade those things and so we might see that kind of thing with altcoins and all that so we, the frenzy might not be over uh, mm -hmm. if we go again through a big phase of big boom again we might no matter how that this is not going to have a choice we'll see again people going to a frenzy of investing into all coins because oh it's smaller and volatility is higher i'm going to be able to make money because it jumped by by a factor of 10 as opposed to bitcoin and now it's just a factor of four or five you know and it's 10 is better <laughs> and so we we should expect the kind of thing we saw in 2017 is possibly likely to happen again uh, until we have this kind of event I mentioned before where suddenly we're going to have a hyper-Bitcoinization that will civilize things because there won't be any need for speculation at that point. Gotcha. That's an interesting way of thinking about it. Okay. Phil, any final words, final thoughts? Um, well, so far it was it was great. Uh, I'll be in uh, Biarritz in France uh, from August twenty third to twenty fifth, oh. and for anyone uh, out there listening, uh, and I'll be at the Pacific Bitcoin October five and six, and so I'm looking forward to to meet everyone there. Fantastic, absolutely wonderful, wonderful stuff, Phil. Thank you for all the time and effort. First of all, oh, that thank you, you put into actually writing the book and putting it out there so people can get that broader landscape. Mm -hmm. And thank you for being on the show and being so generous with your time and your thinking. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Be well. Thank you for thank you all for having me. Take care. think if Bitcoin didn't exist, CBDCs would be the most egregious tool of tyranny that humanity's ever seen. But Bitcoin is going to be such a powerful check on CBDCs that if the powers that be want anybody to adopt their CBDCs, they will need to be less egregious than they would have been otherwise, because they'll, they don't want to force everybody into Bitcoin. If Bitcoin exists and they create death coin everybody will go tomorrow into bitcoin they know they can't make it as bad as they could have right and so i think that's my, my optimistic outlook is having a good form of money present next to those cbdc's will make those not as bad as they would have been otherwise